Okay, hey people. Uh, welcome to the very first video for protein structure. We're finally in protein structure, which is a wonderful place to be in biochemistry because um, it get, means that we're getting to some fun stories. Okay, so this first video um, is the primary structure of a protein. After this watching this video, you should be able to describe the primary structure for a protein, draw the arrow pushing mechanism for peptide bond formation. There will be a mechanism on every single exam, just so you know. And then you should also be able to describe three pieces of information you can learn from the protein's primary structure, and we'll do a little teeny tiny bit of vocabulary. All right, here we go. Okay, so what is a, a primary structure for a protein? So the primary structure um, describes the sequence of amino acids, also known as residues, going from the N-terminus to the C-terminus. So if I have the N-terminus here, and we'll talk about what that means, and then a chain of amino acids to the C-terminus, the primary sequence is the order of these going from one to, let's say, 100, if there's 100 amino acids. Um, this might look like uh, leucine, alanine, lysine, arginine, cysteine, cysteine, valine, uh, glutamine, aspartate, so on and so forth. So the primary structure just describes the order in which the amino acids appear going from N-terminus to C-terminus. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we get to the primary sequence, so how you go from amino acids to the polymer that is the primary sequence of polymers, a repeating unit of monomers. We'll draw some out and we'll talk about our Vocabulary. So the first thing that we're going to do um, is we're going to talk about how this polymer is formed. Okay. So a polymer is a repeating unit of monomers. In this case, our monomeric unit is an amino acid. So let's draw the mechanism. So this is a, a condensation mechanism. Condensation mechanism meaning that in the course of the reaction, um, water is lost. So you're going to have a loss of water somewhere. If you don't lose water, you haven't done it right. Um, so this is the peptide bond formation. Now in the cell, this is catalyzed by the ribosome in translation. So remember, translation is, uh, remember we go, uh, what is it? Uh, replication, um, transcription, and translation. So translation is going where the ribosome reads the mRNA and it adds amino acids in one at a time. This is super thermodynamically unfavorable. So when the ribosome does this, it uses an ATP to help catalyze the reaction and input the right amount of energy so that this happens. We're not going to draw the ribosome. We're not going to draw all the parts of the ribosome. We're just going to draw the peptide bond formation that is uncatalyzed, so they're not going to add any extra parts, we're not going to add ATP or anything like that. Okay, so we're going to do this for two amino acids. So I'm going to start NCC and NCC. H3+, plus. draw these ones out. I haven't attempted to draw a mechanism on this program yet, so hopefully it turns out okay. Okay, the R group here is unimportant because it's not actually part of the mechanism. Okay, so we're first going to start by we have to make a good leaving group. And the good leaving group is going to be off of this O- minus on the carboxylic acid. Eventually it will become water, but first we're going to make it an OH. So it's going to grab that hydrogen, and these electrons will move to that nitrogen. And again, I'm going to have to zoom out and keep pushing this around Um so that you can see what's going on here. So I'm going to redraw N, C, C, O, and now this is an O, H, and we have H with nitrogen with lone pairs. The charges are all canceled. C, C. 
you don't have to draw this out in the same amount of steps that I'm doing it. You can draw all the arrows probably in one go. I'm just drawing it out so you can see um, where everything is going. Okay, so this nitrogen has the lone pairs. It is going to attack this carbonyl carbon that makes that nitrogen the nucleophile and this carbonyl carbon the electrophile. Electrophiles want electrons. Okay, um, we're going to push the electrons up to oxygen. And I will draw what happens after that. Again, like I said, you don't have to draw this out in as many steps that I'm doing. I'm just doing it so you can see all the steps drawn out real nice and slow. All right, so this now, this oxygen now has a minus. We still have the OH here. And the carbon that was a carboxylic acid carbon is now attached to this nitrogen. It also has two H's. all my parts and pieces here. Okay, these electrons will come back down to reform the carbonyl carbon. We're going to have this hydroxyl group be our leaving group, but in the process, it's actually gonna grab, sorry, this has a positive, um, a hydrogen from that nitrogen to become water, and we're gonna dump those electrons back down on that nitrogen. Now, hmm, I wonder what we've lost there. Let's see. This piece right here is water. That's where our water comes off, okay? So the product of this step is NCC. We have our carbonyl is reformed. It is bound to a nitrogen that now only has one hydrogen, which is connected to all of its other regular parts. R group, R group and H3+, plus, and also we had water coming off. And that is it. That's the whole mechanism right there. What we have formed is what is called the peptide bond. The peptide bond um, is also known as an amide or amido bond. And if you'll notice, when we have two amino acids and they condense, we only get one peptide bond. This right here is considered the C terminus because it is the end of the sequence and it has a carbon in it. This part right here is the N terminus because it is the other end of the sequence but it has the nitrogen in it. And we always read our sequences, our protein sequences going from N terminus to C terminus. And we have one peptide bond and two residues. Okay. All right, now something that you might be asked to do on an exam, in addition to drawing a mechanism, would be to draw the tripeptide, tri meaning it has three, of, let's do cat. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are 20 amino acids, and they all have one-letter codes, which means that most of you can probably draw your entire name um, as a peptide, of amino acids because um, we're only missing six letters. For those of you that need the letter O and the letter, oh, what's the other one? I can't remember. I can give you the letter O if you need the letter O for your name, but most of you will be able to do this. So the tripeptide CAT or CAT um, is cysteine, alanine, and a threonine. So we're going to go ahead and draw this. You should be able to draw these at any given pH between 0 and 14. Let's pick, uh, I'll do, draw this at pH, let's do, let's do three, just to have something different. All right, so here's how I do this. The backbone is always NCC, NCC, NCC. So NCC, there's one amino acid. NCC, there's two amino acids. And NCC, that's three amino acids. Now, at pH three, this amino group will be positively charged because its pKa is 10. That's the alpha carbon carbonyl. And in H, the peptide bond has no pKa, so that is never charged. Please don't put a charge on any of those atoms. Alpha carbon carbonyl, the end of the peptide bond, alpha carbon. And we are again above the pKa for this backbone, so it will be a minus. Now, here's the sulfohydryl. Its pKa is 8. We're below it, so it is completely protonated. 
there's alanine, CH3, and threonine. Doesn't have a PKA that I gave you. So there you go. Uh, that is the tripeptide CAT, C-A-T, at pH 3. There are two peptide bonds. There's one right here and one right here. There's one N-terminus. There's always only one N-terminus and only one C-terminus in a protein because all the other ones disappeared in the condensation reaction. Other things that you should know about this. Uh, when we go from left to right, this would be residue number one, this is number two, this is number three. You may also see this as CS, CYS1, ALA2, and threonine 3. Do you think that you would be able to find the PI of this peptide? That would be something to work out on your own. Again, make sure that you just account for every single every single functional group that has a PKA and you follow the exact same steps as in the PI video that you would for a single amino acid, but now we're just looking at one big giant molecule. All right, all we have to do now is talk a little bit about um, some vocabulary. So I think earlier I had mentioned that a dipeptide, oh man, that looks terrible, equals two amino acids that are connected together with that covalent peptide bond, a tripeptide is three amino acids. And then just in general, what is a peptide? The word peptide is just a super short sequence of amino acids that are linked together in a polymer is a very flexible structure. A protein, however, is different than a peptide. A protein is at least 50 amino acids in the polymer and it has a distinct um, three-dimensional structure. So it has a distinct uh, tertiary or quaternary structure. Okay, and the last thing that we're going to talk about are three pieces of information you can get from a protein's primary sequence. If you go and work with proteins in the laboratory, I think the absolute best place to start is if you're working with a protein, work with, you know, use your computer, dig up as much information on its primary sequence as you can, and that's part of your first molecular modeling assignment is to do this. And so I've got a couple slides here um, because this is really hard for me to draw, so I'm going to use the slides to represent different information you can find from a primary sequence. Okay, so the first thing that um, you can find from a protein's primary sequence is if you go to the protein databank um, and you put in the PDB ID, that's this right here. So the PDB ID is a code that represents each different protein structure or DNA or RNA structure that's been uploaded to the protein databank. Um, for this one right here, this is anthrax. It's the lethal factor of anthrax, which is a protein that um, causes all the bad things the anthrax, all the, all the symptoms that anthrax causes. Um, if you were in the protein databank, you would see that for the primary sequence, you can predict regions of secondary structure. So the order of the amino acids can give rise to specific secondary structures, which we'll talk about next time. But basically, these are amino acids that are near each other in sequence, not far away. So like they're neighbors in a neighborhood. Um, it can predict regions of alpha helices or beta strands. There are some portions in this sequence that you'll notice that have no structure. They're like these lines right here. Um, no structure. We'll talk a little bit about what their function is. Super important to have these unstructured bits. But these curly lines right here, those are alpha helices, and these arrows right here represent beta strands. And you'll see some, some of these others are some other interesting pieces in here that we'll talk about in the next video. So one of the things that you can tell or predict from a protein's primary sequence are the regions of secondary structure. 
Um, here's another sequence. This is ricin. Here's its PDB ID, so you could go look it up in the PDB ID. It has a much shorter protein sequence, but you can see right here it's mostly alpha helical. There's some beta strands, um, and then of course there's these unstructured bits, which are really important. Okay, the other two things. Um, oh man, this got all Katie Wonka. Hmm. Okay, in the slides, if you look in the slides that I'll post, you'll be able to see this a little bit more nicely, but this is called a, a sequence alignment. Okay, so this looks a little bit odd, like I said. In the slides, you'll be able to see that actually all of these letters are aligned really nicely, one right on top of each other, particularly all the bolded ones. So what you see in a protein sequence alignment are um, different organisms of the same protein uh, different organisms that have the same protein and their sequences are aligned or stacked on top of one another. So what I have on top of here are again the regions of predicted protein um, structure, uh, protein secondary structure. You can also predict um, evolutionary relationships, so using phylogeny. We're not going to spend much time on that in this class because I don't think it's as important. You cover it in many other classes, genetics, bioinformatics. But what we're going to focus on is particularly for the first modeling assignment is you use a protein sequence alignment to predict regions of structural or functional importance. So what I have highlighted here are the residues, and I'm sorry that this didn't work out, but normally they would be stacked right on top of each other. The residues that are conserved, that means they don't change across sequences or across species. It's the same all the way through. If it's the same all the way through, that must mean evolutionarily there's a reason for it. That residue is either functionally or structurally important. The structurally important residues tend to be your nonpolars. And you'll learn why when we get to tertiary and quaternary structure. The functional residues are any of the polars. Doesn't matter if it's neutral positive or negative. These are the ones that can actually help perform some of the reactions so they're more functionally important. Now, the polar ones can be important for structural and the structural ones can be important for function. Or, I mean the nonpolars can be important for function. Um, so this is not a hard and fast rule but it's sort of a generalization that typically the nonpolars are structural and the polars are functional. So this arginine right here and this arginine right here, again, these are supposed to be lined up, stacked right on top of each other, um, are likely Im functionally important. This um, FW, 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 um, phenylalanine, tryptophan, those are nonpolars, and those are likely to be important for structure. What does this mean? So if you're working with this protein in a laboratory, um, either don't mutate these or do and see what happens right? So the three things that you can find out are regions, uh, predicted regions of secondary structure, evolutionary relationships, that's the, you know, phylogenies, you've probably seen these um, in other courses, or at least you've probably seen a diagram of them before. And the third thing that you can predict are regions or residues of structural and or functional importance by looking for conservation Again, conservation means the same across all species, or at least of the same type. So this F, F, W, W, those aren't exactly the same, but they're all nonpolar aromatics. Okay, um, that's all for now, and I'll see you in class, and the next video up will be secondary structure.